is the cartoon that we have last night. And what we have is a cartoon of Charlie Chaplin eating the boot from hunger. So this is an old movie where he's desperately starving. And finally, he just kind of gives in and starts eating the boot. And we have three different reactions. We've had people laughing, the people kind of smiling, and the people who are pretty sad. So what I want you to talk about with your group is why are they having these different reactions? And how does this connect to the spoon theory? And how does this connect to gaslighting and oppression? So talk about that for a little bit, and we'll check it in a couple minutes. All right. What are you getting from the cartoon? It feels like they've got a good Sorry. Those for me, I kind of took the spoon theory as like. Wait, hang on. Let's start with the cartoon first. Oh, okay. I was going to connect it. Oh, go for it. Okay, um, so for me, I took the spoon theory as like choke considering when you get a certain amount and you can only get a, like, a specific amount and you want to use them that's if they're gone. Mm -hmm. And so in part two, I see that, that you know, he has no spoon. Mm -hmm. So people that are poor kind of relate because they're like, oh, he has nothing. Mm -hmm. Like they see what it's symbolizing. Mm -hmm. The richer don't really understand, so it's kind of just funny. Uh -huh. Excellent. So we've got the relatability, right? So the poor folks remember what it's like to be hungry, mm -hmm. and they can relate. The rich folks, it's just it's absurd, right? It's a joke. It's clearly a joke. You can just laugh at it. Somebody eats shoes. It's just a silly joke that's absurd. You can just laugh at it anytime. So the ability to remember and empathize and connect and say, hey, I remember hunger, and hunger really sucks, means that you're going to have a very different reaction. Whereas if you can't even connect to it at all, it's just a silly, funny joke. So I moved to the US from Costa Rica specifically because of homophobia. And I have a very similar conversation that I get to hear all the time when people ask me, oh my god, you came from Costa Rica to Portland. Why would you leave paradise? It rains so much here. So this happens all the time to me. And I kind of gotten used to the typical responses. At that point, I have right a little microaggression moment where I have to decide what to do. Do I answer the truth and then deal with the consequences there? Or do I just blow them off and say something, whatever, innocuous? and then kind of do all the crappy on the inside. So usually, when I have enough energy, I'll say, I left because of homophobia. And they don't get it. They'll usually laugh. Why did you leave? Homophobia. Aha. Until eventually they get it. And they go, oh, huh, sorry. If you've never had to actually leave the place you're at to have a better life or be safe or well, you don't even consider that. So for example, the folks who've never migrated don't usually recognize that migration can be a very difficult process and is usually filled with a lot of ambiguity in the best of cases, or a lot of sadness in some other cases. So even just bringing it up so casually isn't something that you might want to do. When you've lived through migration, you know that there's a lot of big stories behind it. You don't usually bring it up quite so casually as that. So let's make a connection between spoon theory and the cartoon. We talked about the fact that empathizing is really important, and the spoon exercise was what she was trying to do to get her friend to understand her. So she was trying to get her to feel the feels that she was feeling, say, have her have an experience where she could kind of connect with, even though she couldn't really. So these experiences by which we try to connect with each other are really important, because even though we know we'll never get it, we can at least try to get there a little bit. Who's got something interesting here on gaslighting and oppression? How does that uh, article treat you? The one about crazy. And your reactions there. Okay. It made me think a lot about their terms because a lot of times, like my friends will like date a guy and then after the breakup, they will be like, oh, well, she was so crazy. And like, and my friends will be like, no, I'm not. I was fine. But I feel like a lot of times the girls like start to believe mm -hmm. that they were actually like, the ones that were crazy in the relationship. And I feel like that over time has like made women feel like they're less than because of all the guests. Mm -hmm. Excellent. It's okay. Um, I grew up in a home with an alcoholic and a bipolar mm -hmm. person. So um, there were a lot of messages put onto me that their emotions were my fault mm -hmm. and that their reactions to who I was and what I was doing um, were my fault. Mm -hmm. um, so it caused me to suppress my feelings and to act in order to diffuse situations and really disconnect from myself for my own protection mm -hmm. um, and to try to prevent the flame from coming onto me. 
and to support and uplift the people who are actually making you feel terrible. Mm -hmm. um, so I really related to gaslighting in the way that it showed up in my codependent upbringing. Mm -hmm. um, and we were talking in our group about how gaslighting is a really clear example of interpersonal oppression mm -hmm. and how to um, kind of put the messages that the great big oppressive subject puts on to the oppressed people but it's interpersonally mm -hmm. and then it has consequences because it's reflective of the whole oppressive system. You talk about shifting blame, which is really important. So gaslighting has a lot to do with saying, this is on you, not on me. You're the one who's doing this. You're the one who's making me react this way. You're the one who's bringing this out on me. This isn't a me thing. This is a you thing. Go ahead. Um, in that video, the first video we saw, the switch video. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, the oppressed majority. In the end of the video, um, you notice that uh, says, as the, the man says, oh, look at me, like, oh, um, I, I, this happened to me and everything. My uh, brother's fought for this and everything. And then the woman says, oh, you just, like, oh, yeah, just, just put the point the blame on him and said, look the way you're dressed. Yes. Look the way you look. Mm -hmm. You're dressed like this, and that's what happened. Excellent. That's why it happened. You shift the blame onto the victim, and this is all your fault because of what you did or what you said. So gaslighting is a really important ingredient for oppression and work. You have to keep people kind of confused. So the term gaslighting comes from this old movie, 1940s, and it's talking about something in like the 1890s. Go right ahead. I was talking about this. Um, it's talking about this old movie where um, there was somebody who married a woman to try to get at her money, and so he was trying to make her feel crazy so that she would end up in an institution and that he could keep her money. So pretty much he had a campaign to make her feel like she was crazy. So he would hide things from her and say, like, where is the thing? And she's like, I, I had it right there. I was like, mm -hmm. you're losing stuff again. And he ended up messing with the lights. And she'd say, like, that's so weird that the lights are dim because they were gas lights. Uh, and he'd say, the lights are perfectly fine. What are you talking about? So the idea was to kind of get her to doubt herself so that she wasn't even sure what was right and what was wrong anymore. Like, am I actually, am I seeing this or am I overreacting? actually understanding this correctly? I was like, no, maybe I'm making stuff up. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I was just going to say it becomes, um, over time, less about them. Well, uh, you know, after they have oppressed you in that way, it becomes you start to silence yourself before mm -hmm. they even have to. Yes. Because of the self-doubt. Yes. It's a really important reaction. Mm -hmm. It's a really important part of oppression is if you can get the subordinate group to actually just shut themselves up, mm -hmm. it'll go much, much easier. Yeah. So they stop pushing back so so gaslighting and misperception and telling people that they're overreacting is an absolutely crucial, important part of oppression. Um, I think that gaslighting easily transitions into horizontal hostility mm -hmm. because what's once, horizontal hostility? So let's say um, I now believe that I'm crazy because someone has been gaslighting me, mm -hmm. and now I walk around believing that I'm crazy and I see behavior that reflects my own from someone who reminds me of myself, and now I tell them they're crazy. I believe that they're crazy, and now I keep them down because I've internalized my oppression. So horizontal hostility is when members of, of an oppressed group oppress members of their own group. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So we, I might be the one who's saying, what were you wearing, right? She's a slut, she was wearing a mini skirt. Right? She deserves what she gets. Even though I don't benefit from sexism and I didn't create the system of sexism, I can make sure that I'm part of the people who enforces it. I end up leading the crime and then I end up repeating it as well. So I'm not benefiting from sexism, but I am participating in keeping it going. So the antidote to gaslighting. Gaslighting is when somebody tells you that what you're perceiving is wrong and that you are uh, putting yourself into doubt, you're kind of giving contradictory information. So the antidote to gaslighting is validation. When somebody says, Oh my God, I have that experience too. Like, no, I totally have that. It's like, of course you're reacting that way because that's a normal, typical, good reaction to have. Anybody would react like that. And sometimes when you get validated, you have that feeling like, right, right, like you saw that. I'm not making that up. You saw that too. So sometimes some of my students have said that reading that article of that you're not crazy is really validating. It's like, ah, that's what that was. Right? I wasn't making that up. I wasn't imagining things. It was a thing. Somebody was manipulating me. Validation can feel that way. That's why consciousness raising groups are really powerful, where we get um, subordinate or oppressed peoples together. 
and we say, hey, I just had that same experience you had. You had that too. Let's work this together. So validation is a crucial antidote to oppression. Um, we see like in like movies mm -hmm. where like it's like the abusive man mm -hmm. and like he tells the, like his wife or his woman mm -hmm. he's like, oh, you're not, like, you're silly, don't do that. You can't do that. Like, you're, you don't have potential. And then later on that, that lady finds potential somehow, some way, mm -hmm. through like peers or something. Mm -hmm. And then she finds that potential and she's, and it's like the thing is like he was holding her back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I see that a lot in like the movies and everything else. Mm -hmm. just in the movie. And we see this with all the oppression. So we see it with men and with women. We see it with white people and brown people. We see it straight people with queer people. This happens all the time where you're, you're told that you are wrong, that your reactions are wrong, that your identity is wrong, that you're misperceiving, that you're overreacting. It's a really important part of keeping oppression going. When we can talk to each other and say, no, I have that same thing that you do, we can kind of recognize, oh, this isn't a me thing. This is a structure thing, and then we get to push back on it. So what I have now is a word that I made up. So this is a term I call agent ignorance. Um, I made it up because I needed a word to talk about this thing without being easy to understand. So I have a hand up for you. I will totally give this to you in a minute, but as soon as I give it to you, I'll lose it. So I'll tell you about it right now, and then you have a hand out that you get to read and talk about with your group. So the idea of agent ignorance, what I'm trying to get at, is that the ignorance goes one way. The agents are the people who are ignorant, not so much the subordinates. So the targets have to understand the game in order to stay alive, not so the other way around. This is some of the stuff that you were reading last night. So if you were to think, for example, of um, your boss. If you walk into work and you are having a really bad day, your boss doesn't particularly need to care. If you walk into work and your boss is having a really bad day, you need to be sharp. You, that is not the day to ask for stuff, that is not the day to mess up. You need to like, stay out of their way because the fact that they have power over you means that this could cost you later on. Mm -hmm. So your boss doesn't even need to notice you're having a bad day, but you sure do the other way around. This repeats across oppression. So if we were to think about, for example, um, and I'm going to say a waitress and a, um, a patron in a restaurant. The waitress needs to make sure that the customer is comfortable, not so the other way around. Because the power dynamic goes in only one direction. Or if you think about a car and a pedestrian. So if one of them makes a mistake, whether the pedestrian or the car driver, um, the pedestrian is going to be the one that pays the price. So privilege kind of acts like a shield. So the person driving around, even if they don't want to make a mistake, they're not the ones who pay the price. Because privilege acts like kind of like a steel box kind of a shield. So it protects you. You don't need to care very much. As a shield, it also kind of blocks your view. So you don't know stuff not seeing very well. And there's a few reasons why the agents don't understand the dynamic very well. First one is they're not exposed to the target's lives very much. Right? We don't see target lives in movies or media. We're not seeing lots of queer movies. We're not seeing lots of people of color movies. We're not seeing people in poverty on TV shows. We only see the dominance. When we see TV shows, when we see the news, we're talking about the people in power, not so the other way around. So they have less exposure to the target's lives. The other thing is, is that when the dominants find out about their privilege, it feels really awful, right? You have that ego glow thing where you're not so proud of yourself anymore, and there's that guilt and shame thing. So even if you're exposed to these ideas, that'll make you really, really uncomfortable. So even as you try to learn, you get guilty and shameful, and you kind of avoid the conversation altogether. So you end up not knowing very well. Also, um, they don't, we said, they don't need to, they don't like to, and they'll resist it, which is what we're talking about with fragility. Even when the information comes at you, what you're hearing is that you're a terrible, horrible person, and you'll push back on it and say, no, 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 this isn't me. I'm not one of those people. So we have a few things keeping the dominance from knowing stuff, keeping them very, very ignorant. There's a phrase in disability rights, which is awesome, called nothing about us without us. And what they're saying is, nothing should be decided about us that doesn't involve us. So there should be no votes, no discussions, if we're not the ones at the table. Because even with the best intentions, they're gonna make really dumb decisions. And I do this all the time, right? As an equality person, I can try to set up a room in an event, and I'm gonna screw up a million ways, and I've done it a million times. I have this event, I have everybody there, 
got the food set up, and then my colleague uh, comes in with a wheelchair, and I realize, oh my god, I didn't set up the food in a way that could be accessed by somebody with a wheelchair. Great intentions, but I might make really dumb decisions because I don't know what goes into navigating my food in a wheelchair. So what we need to do is nothing about us without us. The ignorant folks should not be the ones making the decisions, even when they have the best intentions. We need the experts making the decisions about their own lives, because they're the ones who know. So one of the things I'm going to push for is a really deep humility, is understanding that you are deeply, deeply ignorant about this thing. And so you need to let them make the decisions, not you. So I have a handout for you. I want you to take a look at it. What you're going to do with a group is talk about it. It sounds like it makes sense. Try to see if you can explain it. There's a very different skill set between hearing something and saying something. See if you can try to explain it to each other. All right, how's this idea sitting with you? What are you getting from it?
So nothing about it without it is really important because the people making decisions will make really dumb decisions because they don't know stuff. They're really ignorant about the thing. Even with the best intentions, they're not the experts on this oppression. They're going to make really bad calls. Likewise, when the conversation is about that particular oppression that benefits you, you're likely to kind of minimize it and say, that's not that big of a deal, or you're overreacting, or you should, you should use this strategy or that strategy. And it's kind of like, actually, this is not your place to speak about this because you don't know stuff. Because all you've been seeing forever and ever is yourself in a mirror. You don't actually know all the stuff that's going on back there. So again, this is not a great place for you to be speaking up from because we know that you're pretty ignorant. We might even cut you a little bit of slack if you're coming in with humility and saying, hey, I don't know stuff. Totally, we'll stop and educate you sometimes when we have the energy. Um, <laughs> but humility will take you a whole long way. Talking over people or minimizing is just really not going to work. Nothing about us without us is really important. And I am your teacher. So you've heard about some of my identities. You know which ones I'm really, really dumb about. There's a whole bunch of stuff I'm really ignorant about. A great big one is class, right? I grew up middle and upper middle class. I am sixth generation college graduate. I know that that is not your educational experience, more likely than not in this classroom. You know how dumb I'm gonna be about the decisions that I make about you as students? I'm gonna mess up left and right because there's a whole bunch of stuff I don't see. So as a teacher, I am asking you and inviting you as much as possible to tell me about all the mistakes I'm making. Not only am I not going to resent you for it or get mad at you for it, I'm going to be actually grateful. So if you can come to me and say, hey, sis teacher, I'm a trans student and you just messed this up. I'm not going to be mad at you. I'm going to be really, really happy, eager. I actually want to know because I really want to learn because I want to make sure that I'm not hurting people as much as possible. One of the reasons we got to think about is who is in which position is because they're going to come in with dumbness about some, some identities. And so it's really important that we have teachers of color. It's really important that we have immigrant teachers. It's really important that we have queer teachers. It's really important that we have teachers who are first generation college students. And we don't really have a lot of diversity when it comes to faculty. And we have a lot less diversity, even more so, when it comes to admins. The higher up you go in rank, the more homogenous, the more sane everybody looks. And those are the identities with power. That's why we call this agent list, the president list. The more of these identities you hold, the easier it is for you to climb the ladder. So in order to change the hierarchy and the structure, we gotta make sure that we're shoving people from this group up into power. Because they have expertise that's often not valued. So, my takeaway for today is I'm really hoping to get you focused on humility. The first task is to say, am I on the ignorant side here? And if so, this is a place for me to stop and listen and not argue.